Hello, I'm Barnaby and welcome to the Strathside's Flight Readiness Review for the Mac 24 launch competition. So, starting off with the executive summary, our team members are listed on this slide here. There'll be myself, Jamie McKenzie, our mechanical team lead, uh, Daniel Stebbings, who is our electrical team lead, and Kyle Pereira, our coding team lead. In addition to the sub-team leads, we'll also have Yosef Kotsian Briggs, who is a first-year representative in the mechanical team, and Callum Scott, who is a third-year representative of the coding team. When it comes to the missions, they stay vastly the mostly the same as the critical design review, where our primary missions are to launch a deployable payload with less than 5,120 newton seconds of impulse, uh, and also to use a two-stage or dual deployment recovery system to minimize the drift. Our secondary mission will remain to transmit live video from the launch vehicle. Our tertiary missions will be to re use recycled 3D printer filament for plastic components, and to use edge machine learning to, to analyze any flexural torsional fin flutter from the launch vehicle. Um, Touching on the 3D printed components, we've been unable to find a partner to recycle our used filament. So our current plan is to melt down our to melt down our used plastics and to cast them into a shape that we need using a silicone or a sand mold. And here we have defined our success criteria. I will now give you a summary of the payload of the vehicle. The payload is mainly unchanged since the CDR. Uh, so it's still going to be testing Firefly version 1.1, live streaming video, from the vehicle to the ground and using the speed of sound uh, changing as the CANSAT descends to measure altitude as well as uh, the track and ground station tracking the vehicle to get a good signal from the computers on board to get as good of a video as we can. Uh, the mission statement for the payload is also unchanged, still launching CANSAT to three kilometers, measure the speed of sound and relay the live telemetry online to Twitch. The changes to the payload, there's not a lot uh, difference in CDR, the internal layout of the AV base light is slightly different, and the planetary gear system for the track and ground station to be moved using the servo motors is ready for testing. Here is the success criteria for the payload, which involves the computers on board communi communicating with the ground during flight as much as possible and as accurately as possible. This, as well as the SRAD computers, demonstrating that they are agreeing with the COTS computers about deployment by lighting up an LED in view of the camera on board. We will do this by using We'll see when the, the LED is lit during flight, and we can compare that to what time it is during flight and see when the deployment events take place. Another success criteria is that the track and ground station is able to track the vehicle accurately to get the strongest signal from the 2.4 gigahertz antenna for the live video as we can. I uh, will now give you a, an overview of the final design of the vehicle and what has changed. Since CDR, there have been a couple of changes to the fore of the vehicle, namely that the bulkhead at the base of the nose cone has been moved to the forward move forward to the base of the plastic tip, allowing the space in the nose cone to be used. We've also been made aware of the possibility that during the second deployment event, the main chute could, may get stuck in the four tubes. And this will be tested when we do an objection test at, at Sara in Fairlymore, with Sara at Fairlymore. Another change is the plastic tip is no longer going to be uh, printed, but cast PLA. This is because despite our best efforts, we haven't been able to find anywhere that would um, take our old PLA uh, parts and recycle them back into filament and this is a way to make sure that the old parts are reused and um, these parts will be once the casting is complete extensively tested to make sure they are as just as strong if not stronger than the old parts as well as we're casting the tip um, the nose cone tip being the only structural part being made in this way because it is a very simple it will be a very simple mold and so we can be sure uh, it'll be easier to be sure that the PLA uh, fits fits the mold nicely uh, the avionics bay is largely unchanged, uh, there's no mechanical changes, there's just some adjustments of some computers inside for convenience sake. Um, the payload bay is also unchanged since CDR, uh, there have been no mechanical changes and the payload itself is also the same. Uh, the aft section, the, there have been a, some small changes here, the, um, the retaining ring that was going to be custom made by a sponsor is now going to be uh, one that we bought from Black Hat Rocketry. Um, this is just to remove as much complication as possible. This also means that the boat tail is just going to be screwed directly into the, uh, the rear of the vehicle. Again, just removing as much complication as possible. We'll now go over our, the recovery subsystems for the vehicle. The main chute will be deployed at Apogee and allow the vehicle to descend at uh, roughly 33 meters per second until it reaches about 300 meters of altitude, when the drogue chute will then deploy, bringing the vehicle to the ground at 11 meters per second. The shock cord will be mounted at the top of the nose cone with an eye bolt, as well as at the rear and the top of the AV bay with a U-bolt, and lastly at the top of the motor zone with another U-bolt. 
the cord will be made of nylon webbing and Kevlar cord. As mentioned earlier, the drogue will be deployed at Apogee and the main at 300 meters and will be controlled by redundant COTS computers, an easy mini and an ectama quark. Uh, as also mentioned earlier, an ejection test will be performed at the Fairly Moor with SARA. This will allow us to make sure that the main chute does not become stuck in the four tubes of the vehicle and the CANSAT and drogue chutes deploy effectively and without tangling. Uh, as mentioned in CDR, we did have some issues with uh, the stability being too high. We will go over these in more detail later in the presentation. We have sought advice from Colin and Chris via email, but since they're away at Spaceport America, we are still waiting a response. Since the majority of our team has been heavily involved with the our entry into nation, the National Rocket Crew Championship, which only very recently flew, there has been very little chance for much construction to take place. We have cut the body tubes to length, but so far that is the main things that have happened. Uh, since so little construction has been done, no mechanical tests have been performed as of yet, but we will go over our drift simulations later in the presentation. Uh, going over the payload, the payload is now fully designed and is just awaiting 3D printing to allow mechanical and electrical testing. Moving on to the flight analysis for this year's vehicle. We've been using OpenRocket and RocketPy extensively in order to simulate the ascent and descent stages of both the launch vehicle and the CANSAT. RocketPy has been ex especially useful in the descent profile of the CANSAT, as well as the launch vehicle, as OpenRocket does not allow for you to simulate a deployable payload. Depth on the RocketPy simulations. We define a vehicle with a payload, a vehicle without a payload, and the CANSAT itself, all as separate vehicles. For the simulations, the first, the vehicle with the payload will have its simulation terminate at Apogee, and the vehicle without payload and the payload will have their simulations start at the Apogee, so there should be no discon discontinuity between the two simulations. This allows us to simulate the CANSAT drift very accurately from the Apogee, using its weight and its parachute, as well as the coefficient of drag of that parachute. The CANSAT will be using the same size parachute as the drogue chute for the launch vehicle, which in turn means it will drift a little bit further away from the launch site than the launch vehicle will. With that in mind, we've combined the data from both the launch vehicle and the, and the CANSAT landing locations. For now, we've made a table with the wind, simulated wind speed and launch rail angle, and determined whether a, a determined launch will be legal or illegal based on its drift distance from the launch rail. In the guidelines, this is defined as 1.5 kilometers. However, we can dynamically adjust our termination point in code. So as we can see on the graphs here, we have a legal launch possibility for every wind speed between zero and 10 meters per second. There is also some very obviously suboptimal launch angles there. For example, we do not want to be launching vertically when the wind is gusting at 10 meters per second or launching at a 20 degree angle when the air is completely still. For example, having both of these educators on the sheet is a nice validation point for which launch angles are sensible or not. As we get closer to the day, and as the GFS forecasts start to come out, we can start to use Monte Carlo simulations to determine an uncertainty ellipse for where our launch vehicle will land, hopefully making the recovery easier. So as mentioned earlier, our static margin does have quite a large um, range. So it starts at about 1.5 calibers when it leaves the pad. It does get up to about 4.8 at burnout. We, we, we know this is because about a third of the launch vehicle's mass is the motor. We're working on trying to, um, trying to fix this by using a combination of aft ballast, adjusting the fin size, and experimenting with the shape of the camera pods as well. Um, what we would appreciate a bit of technical help, if possible. However, with, even with this, range, this large range in static margin, we have shown that we have acceptable parachute deployment conditions. I'll now pass you over to Daniel, where he'll talk about the electrical aspect of our missions. And now moving on to the electronic side of things. So the battery configuration changed slightly from CDR. The Firefly 1.1 and the Quark are still sharing the supply, as we said. Uh, they used to be on an 18650 2S configuration, and now we're moving to an 18350 2S configuration. So these are still 3.7 volt lithium ion cells, um, but they're a bit shorter. You can see 35 millimeters instead of 65 millimeters, which gives it a little bit more freedom in that avionic thing. Now this does come with a much slower capacity, 900 milliamp hours instead of 26 amp hours. They are rated for 1.8 amp sustained discharge current and all of the battery rate as of the CDR. And you can see in the chart that although we have a much lower battery life with these, it's still over four hours, which is well in excess of what we require. An overview of the testing then. The Firefly Mini, Firefly 1.1, 2.4 gigahertz board, speed of sound payload board, and ground station board, have all been assembled and we are in the stages of testing. Firefly Mini has been fully assembled. The initial tensor tests are complete. UPS radio and some other components are common to Firefly 1.1 as well as the code base. So all the tests we do on Firefly Mini, some of those will also apply to 1.1. Uh, we did test this in an NRC flight, the rocket, 
Uh, but we had some issues there with TPS and radio. We suspect that might be due to interference or the error rate of configuration. And that will have to be sorted out before back. So just an idea of some of the tests we've done here. So that on the right, we have the IMU for the Firefly Mini. Uh, in the center, you have the GPS. We're expecting about a one minute, 14 seconds, 15 seconds time to first fix. Time to first fix. And the pressure sensor on the left, you can see that it's got a pretty good uh, accuracy, although it's quite hard to read that monitor, but it's very able to differentiate just from picking it up. Now we've gone to the COTS flight computers. So Easy Mini was in our NRC rocket, which has not been recovered. We will purchase a new one if needed before competition, but uh, either way, whether it's the same Easy Mini or a new one, both Far from Easy Mini will be ground tested before launch. Firefly 1.1 has been fully assembled, partially tested, and the radio GPS have been tested to be functional, although we still need to investigate the issues with that NRC launch. And the speed of sound payload has been fully assembled. The external buzzer has been successfully tested. It's extremely loud, but pretty confident you'll be able to hear that over any wind noise in our can set. And the signal conditioning and data processing is still to be tested. The tracking ground station motor control board has been assembled, also wasting testing. Same as the 2.4 gigahertz board, although it's quite simple. It's only a single chip that we're going to need to test. Uh, we also did a radio test of our 868 megahertz link. It has a 10 kilometer distance instead of our much more conservative one we proposed with TDR. That's a clear line of sight transmitter on hill, receiver park. Uh, both the Firefly Mini and 1.1 were tested and we found extremely good performance, even in less than ideal circumstances. Uh, this is well in advance of the distances we're expecting to require for our Mac launch, so we're pretty happy with this. Uh, so you can see that uh, just how far away the transmitter is. We're using a Yaki on the ground station, and you can see some of the packets we we're sending back and forth on the right picture there. Uh, I will note that we were even able to find a uh, good signal just with two omnidirectional antennas, which we're very pleased with. Just a summary, uh, we've got really good progress so far. The testing and flight configuration is still to be done, and we are confident we'll be ready by the competition. So here we can see a concept of operations for the Mac 24 competition for at least our theme. Before anything, we'll be loading Pyrodax into the avionics bay. We pl at the moment, we're thinking it will be 0 0.5 grams in the forward ejection charge for the main parachute, and 1.5 grams for the drogue parachute and payload deployment. This will be tested at an ejection test in fairly mer. Next up, we turn on the computers with a set of four screw switches. After the avionics computers and the campsite computers are both turned on, we'll then assemble the rocket fully making sure the cam set is in the correct orientation. While this is being done, we'll ensure the GPSs on, on all of the computers with GPSs have a, a correct fix. So this, this will be on both the Firefly 1.1s in the avionics bay in the cam set, as well as the Firefly Mini in the cam set. Once the vehicle is assembled, we'll take it to the pad, and then step zero on the operation, on the concept of operations is ignition. After ignition, the motor will burn for approximately two seconds, and burn out going at Mach 1.05, approximately. And at Apogee, that will deploy the CANSAT and the Drogue parachute. This is where the concept of operation splits in two. Following the launch vehicle on the way down, we'll deploy the main parachute at an altitude of three, three to 500 meters, and then land us at 4A. Then rejoining the CANSAT, we'll be, we'll be measuring the speed of sound continuously on descent, transmitting this back to the ground station, and uh, once again, touching the ground at step 4A. We then go out to recover the vehicle, hopefully using the Spacelink app that we've been developing over the last couple of years. And once we've got the, both the launch vehicle and the can set back, we'll go into our two-hour slot to prepare our post-flight review. Going on to outreach, we currently don't have a plan to, for any outreach. However, however, we do have a couple of members who went to school here in Glasgow. We can tr try and go to their schools and sort out a, a small, low-risk model rocketry sort of class, like an open rocket workshop or something. I think that would be quite fun for them. So, to wrap things up, we're still having problems with the stability of our launch vehicle. This is something we are trying to get wrapped up, trying to get sorted as quick as we can. As we have already started manufacture and we require a sufficiently weighted model of the launch vehicle for our ejection test, we're pretty confident we'll get this done before the ejection tests in a couple of weeks. Um, moving on, the CANSAT is now ready for manufacture. We're ready to start making some of those parts and start testing whether our speed of sound measurement setup works. Uh, the testing of Firefly is going uh, it's going to plan so far, and we had a successful test of the Spacelink app at the National Rocketry Championships this week just gone. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge our sponsors for helping us make this all possible. First, the Strathclyde Alumni Fund, as well as ANSYS, RS, JLC PCB, Altium, SolidWorks, and Recall. Thank you very much for listening and watching.